There we go. So today we're going to talk, well, other than this product, which we just spoke about, which is Mag Eyes, which is I'm going to show, use those today when I'm tying. The other topic today, I need to go back to uh, the spotlight thing. Oops, there we go. Uh, go on, what am I doing here? What am I doing wrong? Okay, and I'll, I'll spotlight myself here so you can. Uh, so you can see what I'm doing here. Come on, come on, go on there. There we go. Okay, so you'll be able to see a little better what I'm going to show you here. Um, what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes is. Uh, leaders for coronament fishing and this is something that we I, I got asked the question a couple of times um, now you can use coronament uh, leaders and coronaments for both river and lake fishing um, and i'll show you a couple of different things that uh, one is is more useful than the other one of the problems with fishing lakes with coronaments is the strike indicator, if you're using very long leaders, uh, lake fishing, which sometimes you have to because if they're deep, uh, the strike indicator gets in the way of retrieving the line far enough so that you can land a fish without having to hold your arm way up in the muddy air. Because the strike indicator will hit the end of the rod tip and you won't be able to retrieve anymore. In river fishing, that's not quite so important because you're typically, using a much shorter leader and the strike indicator is not going to get bunged up on your rod tip. So when I'm fishing rivers, uh, typically I'm not using really big flies. Uh, so I don't need a huge indicator. So uh, there's several different easy to use strike indicators for rivers. This one, these are called a fish pimp. <laughs> and they come in a couple of different sizes. These are about the smallest size. You only want the strike indicator big enough to support the size of fly you've got. What these guys have is a little slot in the foam with a little rubber core. And what you do to attach that to your leader is you put the line in through the slot in the core, and then you give the little rubber thingy that's in there a twist either end and that holds the indicator onto the line and holds it in place and then if you want to remove it you just do the counter twist and pull the line out they're easy to adjust up and down as well so you can adjust the depth quite reasonably well the small ones are a little finicky to fool with but if you're just dealing with a small coronament they're they're not bad um, the next ones i use and i've used these a lot lately for stream fishing is called a thingamabobber. And they're just a little plastic balloon with a pump that's got a hole in it. Working? Good, yeah. Super. And how do and you to get put, and to put the, to put these on the on the indicate on the line, all you do is you, you it's trying to be what there are six and there's top. I think you're not. Can you mute? Can you mute? What do you figure out? Well, someone's got their. I'm just going to mute Ed again. There. Um. So you put your you put your line through as a loop. And then wherever you want it to sit on the line, you wrap the loop around the indicator. And that, that holds it in place, just like that. And to move it, you just have to loosen up the loop and, and slide it up and down the line. The nice thing about these is they are really light and not too bulky. They're fairly easy to cast a reasonable length leader with those. Now Dave, they come in. Dave, could you do it again? Yeah, I, I didn't hear what you were saying. Okay, yeah. 
So what you, what you do with these, is, I hope you can see this, is you just make a, a small loop in your leader. Just, and then you, you poke that loop through the, the, this little eyelet at the top of the indicator. Dave, you're not in front of the camera. Yep, I gotta get over here where you can see it. You can poke that through that hole. This is not easy to do with anyway. That's what you do. You make the loop, you poke it through the hole, and then you wrap the loop around the indicator so that it's, it's, uh, it's going through the hole as a loop around the loop around the indicator, and then it cinches down on that so it doesn't slide up and down. This is a fairly stiff mono, so I couldn't get it to, to do that easily. You can do it if you've got a reasonably uh, flexible mono. They come in, those are the little guys, and they come in really bigger ones. That one would probably be easier. The little loop is hole is a little bigger on those ones, so it'd be easier to get the line through that. If you need a, a, a bigger indicator for heavier weight flies. So that's the traditional indicator. And then Phil Rowley and Brian Chan came up with, well, actually it's Phil primarily, came up with these guys. And this is the Phil Rowley quick release indicator. And what it is, is it's a little piece of foam, colored foam, with a hole in the middle and a peg. The peg goes into the, into the middle of that indicator. And they come in different sizes as well. That's just about the smallest one. And you can see sometimes there's a little bit different shape too. Um, now the way these guys work is you put them on your leader by first putting the indicator onto the fly, on, onto the leader. This is a typical leader that's got a loop at the top. And you put the peg in from the small end so that the narrow part of the peg is facing the top of the leader. And so that it goes in the middle like that. Now to set the indicator, what you do is you make a little loop in the leader like that, right by where you want the indicator. And then you shove the peg with the loop into the hole. And the beauty of this product is first off, it floats with that with this thing down, which tends to make, I think, a little, little more sensitive to hits. Um, the other thing is if you catch a fish and there's a pull on the line as you're trying to land them, it does this. It undoes the indicator so that it slides down your line. So as you reel in your, your fish, this is not gonna hang up on the rod tip. So you can use a really long indicator. Sometimes the guys in uh, Phil and, and company in, in BC, they're using like 20 foot leaders. Well, you know, you get 20, your fish 20 feet away from the rod tip, you're gonna have a lot more trouble landing it. And you just adjust the indicator's depth by sliding it up and down where you put that little loop and shove the peg in. So that's the standard Phil Rowley indicator. Now, one of the drawbacks of this is that if you have just your leader and the leader I would normally use for, you know, shallower lakes, I'd use something like this, a nine foot three X tip standard leader. Uh, is, is if you put a little piece of tippet on the end, and I would use six pound tippet for that, tie it right on the end of the taper leader, or I would use a level leader. You can also use a level leader of about uh, 3X or 2X and run that down the length you need and then put some tippet on. Um, if you aren't careful and you break a fish off, what happens is the knot is not enough to keep this stupid little peg from sliding all the way down the line. And if the fly goes, the, so does the little peg. And uh, Phil being smart doesn't sell extra pegs. <laughs> so if you lose a peg, your indicator is toast. You gotta have another indicator. 
there's two ways to stop that from happening. And one <laughs> is that you use this gizmo here. It's called a bobber stopper. And guys that fish in the with bobbers for a pike and such, for walleye particularly. What these are is a little rubber, rubber gizmo, and they're strung on a little wire. So you put, after you put your indicator on your leader, you stick the tip of your leader through that loop on the end of the little wire that's holding the rubber thing, and you pull this off. So it ends up with this little rubber thingy on your leader right near down near the tippet which means that as the peg comes down, it hits this thing and it won't slide off the end of your line. And you, these are not horribly expensive. You might have trouble finding them at some of the fishing stores here because not a lot of guys bobber fish, but that's what they're called, bobber stoppers. Keep you from losing your bobber. The other thing you can do, and, and this has, there's two reasons for doing this, is you put a swivel on the end of the tip of your river after you've got your indicator up on the on the leader installed you put this on the end of your leader and tie it right on the end of the tip of your leader and you put a little piece of tippet from the bottom end of the swivel out to your fly probably about 12 inches 10 or 12 inches worth of that so what that looks like is here's the here's the end of the typical leader like that with the swivel tied and it's a small black swivel it's a size whatever number 12 small black uh, swivel and then you tie the tippet to your fly on the other end of the of the swivel in alberta you get to use two flies so you can actually use the top eye on the swivel to tie another dropper off it's and very often what we do in fishing rivers in Alberta with two flies is you put a really heavy fly on the one on the bottom of the swivel or even a piece of split shot. And you would just have your lighter weight fly off to the side. Uh, that's a very effective way, particularly to fish for whitefish. Dave, could I just comment on the color of the bobbers or the color of yeah. the swivel? Uh, I noticed you use black and that's really good because some people use silver. And yep. what happens is the fish go after the swivel they hit, they hit of the, the fly. Yeah, <laughs> so the don't swivel. use silver swivels. Yeah, don't use silver gold. Try and find the black ones. And these ones are a falcon falcon product. And I forget where I got these ones, but I you, you know you get about a dozen swivels for not a whole lot of money. So you, and and they will keep the bobber from stop from from the strike indicator from pin from going through. So what I normally would do is I would mix, I would do a set of these up in the little package that the leader comes in, uh, pre-rigged, and I, I would not use the uh, the standard loop to loop at the top because it's hard to get that loop over top of your bobber. So I would just tie a, uh, a clinch knot onto the loop on the end of my fly line. Uh, and just if I have to replace a whole indicator, I'd replace the whole thing rather than try and make it up on the, on the stream. So that's how I carry it. Now, to one other point for the strike indicator. There's two things. Oh, here, here's another piece of thing you need. You'll need one of these uh, leather things that have some rubber in the middle. It's a leader straightener because if you leave them wrapped up in the pocket like that, sometimes it'll come out with a preset kink or, or swip uh, in, the, in the leader. You just run the leader through that to straighten all the kinks out so that your leader hangs nice and straight. And the reason for that is you want to take all the slack out of the line. You don't want you. That's another reason for the swivel is you don't want the line going down to your fly from the indicator to have a lot of wibbles in it because you won't detect the very quick and light strikes that you get on, on some flies. So you want to take that slack out. So that's why you use a swivel. One of the reasons you use a swivel. The other thing you do is uh, you stick your rod tip in the water after you have cast the fly, the, the whole leader rig out. Stick your rod tip right in the water. Two reasons for that. One is that uh, if your rod tip is above the water, when the fish strikes and you go to set the hook, there's a, a sloop 
a line like this that goes from your rod tip down to the water. And that's slack. So that slows down your hook set. Uh, so if you put the tip in the water, that slack is gone. And then when you strike, you don't strike by lifting the rod. You strike by slipping with your hand like that on the loose rod at the end of your guides. You do a strip set. And that strip sets the hook so quickly that it makes less chance that the fish will spit that hook out before you get a chance to set it up. If you're getting a lot of uh, taps on the indicator but not hooking up, that's part of the reason. You've got too much slap between your hand and the, the fly. Um, setting the depth, uh, you can again, buy these in Alberta. I don't know if you can here. It's a little lead weight with a, uh, with a clip on it. And you can clip that onto your fly, drop it down to the bottom of your lake fishing, and then bring it up 18 inches, set your indicator at that depth. So it's about a foot to 18 inches off the bottom. And then pull it up and take, take this little lead weight off. If you don't have those lead weights, buy a cheap set of forceps, clip them on your fly, and do the same thing. Drop it down to the bottom, set your indicator about a foot off the bottom, and then pull them up and uh, take your, your, your things off. That's typically how you would fish indicators on lakes. In streams, you, you guess. You guess at the depth. If you're wading, you know how deep the water is because how far it is up your leg. And just set about one and a half times that depth. And that will usually have the, the fly bobbing along the bottom. So that's my uh, introduction to the leader rig for fishing coronavids primarily. Uh, you can also use that for uh, balanced leeches if you're fishing leeches in a way. So Dave, a couple of things. Uh, one is um, sometimes when um, like Phil Rowley and uh, Brian Chan and uh, even um, Dale Freshy uh, are coronavid fishing, they'll use a level leader when they have long, long, long yes. leader. So you don't have the issue of uh, dealing with a tapered leader. So uh, that's one thing. Second thing is um, another trick for doing the um, the depth of the water is you can just use a regular uh, bell weight that has yep. um, uh, a little uh, brass uh, eye in it, and you put that onto your hook, and so that you don't lose it, just put a little piece of rubber band on there to over the the hook as well, so it doesn't slide off, and you drop that down. That works beautifully as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the trick is just to get that depth. And, and again, most of the time, if you're, if you're watching Brian and Phil, they're fishing lakes and not necessarily fishing streams. Yes, exactly. You don't have to go through all that rigmarole if you're fishing a stream. Yeah. But the same thing holds true with stream fishing. You, what you want to do with stream fishing indicators as well is keep the slack off the water. <laughs> keep... Keep, you know, you don't leave this big belly of line between the, your rod tip and where the indicator is. You want some slack because you want the indicator to, to uh, indicate touching the bottom and, and being able to be sensitive to a fish strike. But you don't want too much slack because then it's hard to set the hook. Uh, it's e e more important in lakes because in lakes, the fish aren't grabbing something as it goes by. They're swimming up to it. And they're going to suck that thing and spit it out so fast, you barely have time to detect the strike and, and, and hit, the, hit the strike. So that's what I have, we're going to... I have a question about uh, chrominid because in the interior, I'm often dropping down like 30 feet. And so yeah. I'm, I'm doing it on a fast sink line, but I yep. don't really have any kind of good strike indicator. Any, any thoughts of when you're dealing 30 feet down or something to use for a strike indicator? You know, that's, that's what, uh, what happens on those interior BC lakes that have such crystal clear water. Uh, you end up fishing at much greater depth than, than a regular strike indicator would be useful for. Uh, even a strike indicator at a 30 foot depth, you, by the time you see that bobber move, odds are the fish is gone. Uh, one of the ways to stop that is to have a very, very slow retrieve on, on the indicator. You just take like a one inch retrieve, just a slow pinch retrieve, 
And that keeps some of the slack out of the line going to the indicator and from the indicator to the fly, which means the fly will gradually creep along the bottom. Uh, that's one way to, to get the indicator to show the strikes better. But if you're doing what fish Phil and, and company call fishing naked, you're fishing without an indicator. I think the same thing is true. You're, you're going to cast out and you're going to do a countdown uh, knowing how fast your line is going to sink uh, to the bottom. And then you're doing, and, and they wouldn't use a, sometimes you wouldn't use a very long uh, tippet on that. You'd use something like six to eight feet of, of, of leader and you're relying on the line to get your, your fly down to that depth. And then you're doing again that slow hand twist retrieve. That's that's how I would fish naked. But again, I'm not talking where my experience is. It's not 30 feet down. It's maybe 15, 20 feet. You know, a type four sink. It's going to take a while for a type four sink line to get down 30 feet. Yeah, and I fish that depth quite often. Yeah. You could try doing that just using a type four sink and, and keeping the leader relatively short. The longer the leader, the more opportunity that fish has to suck it in and spit it out before he, uh, he detect the strike. Wouldn't a type seven line be better sinking? Line well, be better? yeah, that's, that's lead core, right? <laughs> I, 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 I don't seldom use much over a, a, a type four, a type five sink. Uh, you might be able to get away with with putting a, a you know a, a type two or type three sink and getting some of that uh, you know di four di five uh, lead core or tungsten tungsten core line on the end of your fly line and then a very short leader. Um, I, I yeah I think the long leaders always make a problem with strike detection and setting the hook property because they're going to have some memory in them, they're not going to be straight. And like I say, that fish can go <laughs> literally, they open their gills to suck the fly in. And if it's not food, they just close their gills again and the, the water spits the fly out. You wouldn't, you wouldn't believe how fast they can do that. And 20 foot leaders in the wind, they're no fun to cast. Oh, no fun to cast. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the reasons why I tend to use a, a tapered leader down to a, at most about a three X. I don't go much finer than that because it's a little easier to cast that if it's tapered. If it's a level leader that's uh, call it 12 feet long, it's a little harder to cast. Uh, it tends to sag on the, on the back cast and then whack you in the back of the head, <laughs> yeah. which I have got bruises, you know, <laughs> anyway. So that's, that's number one. Now we're going to tie. Fly, we're going to tie. And that's not it. That's a variation. We're going to tie this guy, which is a carry special. And you really only need two materials well, thread, thread, and two materials for this fly. Now, as I noted in what I sent out to you, uh, this was in, developed by a Colonel Carey back in the 30s and uh, became popularized by Roderick Haig Brown. So I'm going to repeat this, uh, this uh, presentation for the Rod Roderick Haig Brown guys uh, on the third Wednesday of the month, whenever that is. Um, so the, the materials that I'm going to use for this, they say wool for the body or fur. Uh, I like to do it with this stuff, which is embroidery thread. And it's standard wool embroidery thread. It's nothing fancy. It's not silk or anything. It's just standard embroidery thread. And colors, I've got black. I've got olive. I've got some red. And I've got some yellow. Uh, and that's the ones you saw in the pictures that I sent around. They're different colors. The other material is this stuff here, which is pheasant rump. And 
pheasant rump is a fabulous material. It can be used for a lot of things. This is the natural pheasant rump. And you see it has this nice little barring at the end. And on some of them, it has this uh, iridescent bluish sheen to them. Um, that's the, the natural. Uh, and, I, and I guess it depends on where it comes off the, the pheasant's butt as to whether it's got this color to it or whether it's got this color to it. Um, the other, you can get them dyed as well. This is a, a dyed olive. Here's the dyed olive. And dyeing it tends to take away some of the patterning, but it's still, it's still there if it's not too intense a color. And then you can get, that was a, a golden yellow actually, that one. And this one is an olive. And then you can get them in, this is a, a purple, but that's, that's a hard purple to see, but I've also got a much more brilliantly colored this black. I've got one here that's somewhere in here that is uh, a, a brilliant purple. There we go. There it is. Now that's a purple. So if you can buy them in a whole raft of different colors. Um, right, but I'm going to tie with the standard which is the uh, the one that has the uh, the nice pattern on it and is uh, has got a little bit of different color variation in it. What I want to do is get uh, a hook first. I'm going to tie this one on a size eight, two X long hook. You can make longer ones with, with 3x long hook. I, I don't mind them being short. I'm going to bend the barb down. And this vise has a nice little feature on it on this Dyna King that actually grabs the bend of the hook right in a little groove on the on the jaws so that it makes it I don't have to tighten the the vise so it squishes the wire. I just have to get it in that little groove and it will hold it. Thread is uh, a black six aught. I think that's six aught yeah. I'll start that just behind the eye, about an eye width behind, and wrap down the hook shank. And break it off the tip. Run this right down the hook shank all the way to where the barb was. Let it hang. Now, you're going to use two pheasant rump feathers for each fly. Well, until you get going. <laughs> and I'm going to pick a natural pheasant rump that's got relatively long fibers, if I can find one here. That one, uh, maybe I'll have to get the other batch. That one's for smaller flies. I have to find my. I've got an, an, another batch of present room here that has a little longer, has a little longer uh, fibers. There we go. There we go. There's one. I'm going to take one that's got shorter fibers. There's another. So I've got one that's got relatively short fibers. By short, I mean from the stem out to the tip. They're not too short, not too long. And what I do with this is I will take, hold the tip with my left hand, take the fuzzy stuff 
and strip it off the side of the quill. Get that stuff out of the way so I just have the quill to work with. I'm gonna need, I'm not gonna need a whole whack for a tail. So I'll strip off the fibers that I, I don't need till I get down to, you know, about a gap width worth of, of fibers. Scrunch them down like that and measure them shank length. Put that down where the thread is hanging and wrap that down on top of the hook. And I'll wrap up the shank of the hook just until I get a bit of quill on the, on the shank. And then I'll trim off the, the quill. Bring my thread right back up to about three eye widths behind the eye of the hook. Now, one of the reasons why I like using embroidery thread for this is this version of the fly, the original version of the fly doesn't have a rib. Some guys like to tie it with a, a fine wire rib because they want the body to be somewhat segmented. I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna use the embroidery thread. I make a nice soft loop at the front to tie it on. And I will wrap this down the hook shank all the way to where I tied the tail in. That's gonna be where my first wrap of embroidery thread is gonna be. Bring the thread right back up to the front and stop just short of the eye. And I put a half hitch in. That's because I'm gonna use the rotary on my vise to make tying this body easy. So I take my embroidery thread and I hold it out and I will twist it counterclockwise to make a, a nice tight little rope and wrap around the shank of the hook with that nice tight little rope. One wrap in front of the other. Now you'll see that that gives a little uh, roughness or sort of uh, uh, almost like a segmented portion to that. Now, if you did it with a thicker wool, you would do the same thing. It would just make the body a little thicker. I like these smaller ones particularly to have a sort of segmented body and not a fat body. So you can see that that's got a little bit of segmentation to it. And I'll do this in touching turns all the way up to an roughly an eye width and a half or two eye widths behind the eye. Of and I will tie that off right there. Three in behind, couple in front just to lock that in so it doesn't unravel on me. And turn it right down. And I'll wrap back over top of that just to tie the tag end down. And I wanna bring my thread back to about three eye widths behind the eye of the hook. That's where I'm gonna tie my tackle it. And the hackle is this pheasant rump. I'll do the same thing. What I want is for the barbules to be at least and let's see if I got a good one here. Yeah. I want the barbules from the stem out to the tip to be at least shank length long and preferably shank and a half. That's why you've got to sort of go through your pheasant rump to find the ones with long enough barbules. And different packages will have different sizes of barbules. So I did the same thing. I stripped all of the all of the feather off except this little guy that is on not on all of them but on the back of of some of these fibers there's this little fuzzy feather called the after shaft and 
I save that for another type of pattern, which I'll talk about later. See, this one has the main feather and the after shaft on it. And when I, I'll show you the other fly that uses that after shaft. So when I've got that quilt stripped down, I will take the very tip fibers in my right hand and I'll stroke back all of the barbules from where I've got the tip held on. And I might wet my fingers a little bit because I want these to be fairly well tamed. So you'll see I have about a, a shank length of fibers that are stripped to point backwards. And they're at least a shank length, maybe a shank and a half long. I'm gonna tie this in by the tip. Now you see it, it's curved. There's the brightly colored side and the dull side. I want the brightly colored side facing me with the tip to the front. And I'll tie that spot down right where the tip is separated from the fibers going back. And I'll go one, two, three. I'll pull the tip up and hold it with my left hand and wrap a couple or three times in front. And don't let go of it because I'm going to take my scissors down and snip that tip off. Now, by right, wrapping in front and behind, I've now got that feather locked in. I'm going to move my thread forward just a little bit. Take my hackle pliers. Now this is called a fold, the folded hackle technique. So I get my hackle pliers, grab the tip of the butt end of the hackle, wet my fingers, and I've got the colored side facing forward now. I'm going to very gently stroke back with my wetted fingers to fold that hackle around the stem. See how it's folding back there? Then I make a wrap around the hook. And as I come underneath, I wanna stroke those, watch, watch out for the point. I wanna stroke those fibers back as well underneath because they will otherwise get kind of tied up amongst the, the, themselves. So each time I go underneath, I will take and stroke the folded hackle fibers back. And usually you'll get three good wraps if you selected the length right. And when I get up there that I've got stem left, I will bring my thread back over top of the stem three times and do the same thing. I'm going to wrap in front of that stem, cinch it down, a couple of wraps, trim it off. Our last bit of operation is I'm going to make strip back those fibers so they make a little tent around the body and I will wrap a head right from nice smooth head from the eye of the hook back over top of the wraps that I've already got there and I will force it just back a little bit from where I tied those fibers in because what that does is that'll collapse those fibers down around the body a little bit. So that's just a little bit of a, a wrap there. And then come forward and I will do my whip finish. And like for, I will do it a couple times. And trim the thread off. And the last little bit is teeny, teeny bit of Sally Hansen's hard as nails, or what they call it, super tough, something like that. And just get a little bit of glue on that head. Just gives it a little bit of shine and it. Uh, Make sure nothing's going to come undone. Use my bodkin to clear 
the excess screw out of the eye. And that's the carry special. So when you fish this, it's gonna, it's gonna, as you strike, strip it, it's gonna stroke those fibers back, but they're still got enough spring in them that they're gonna pulsate a little like that as you strip the fly. Dave, and, <clears throat> excuse me, Dave, yeah. um, the, the variation you showed with the, uh, the little head, is that yeah. more effective than the carry, do you find? I, I don't think it makes a hell of a lot of difference. It, it, it might make a little more water disturbance, I see. Okay. And and what what the head is is I'll, I'll quick, quickly reprise that with a olive uh, pattern. And I'll just I will use a uh, another two x long. I don't want too long. Actually, I'll use I'll use a three x long because I want a little more length for this because it is going to have the head. So for, for the other one called the Sparrow, I would use a 3X long as opposed to a 2X long. This is number eight hook. Again, I'll use black thread and this will go a little quicker. So start behind the I same sort of thing, and I've width behind. And so you you can tie these pretty quick when you get down to it. Trim that off. Now again, I'm going to use a. I've got an olive this time, a nicely patterned olive, and I again two. To, if you save the tip off the last one, if you're tying multiples of these, you can probably reuse the tip. Um, I'm just gonna sacrifice another feather. And this is an olive, um, again, measure the shank length, put that down where the thread is. There's my tail, up the body a bit, trim it off. Go oh, well. There you go. Okay. Now, and while I'm up the front here, I'm going to take. I'm going to do this with a uh, a light olive thread. This. Oh, sorry, I'm not. I'm going to take. This is for the sparrow, which is the the modification. And we'll do this with a dubbed body. So I have some light all the dubbing here and it's squirrel, squirrel blend or sorry that's awesome possum and I'm going to make a, a dubbing noodle out of that that uh, squirrel or sorry the possum dubbing and I don't want to make it too fat because I can now control the size of the noodle by how much dubbing I put on and how tightly I wrap it around one next to the other. Now this one you can rib, but uh, if you do rib it, I would just rib it with, with thread. Uh, I'd put a piece of thread in before you rib, but this one I'm not gonna rib just to save some time. And all I do is I wrap this fur dubbing and I can, by how tightly in front of each other I wrap the noodle, I can control the thickness of the body fairly well by controlling the, the thickness of the dubbing noodle and how much I overwrap. Um, this takes a little longer than the, the embroidery thread one, but you can, you get a little more fuzz on the body Whereas the embroidery thread one, it's pretty much a smooth body with a little bit of a rib to it because of you twist the embroidery thread. I have seen these tied and I've tied a couple where instead of using 
embroidery thread, I've used long black bear guard hairs. Makes a very hard body uh, with, with a ribbed appearance. I don't know how well that works. I haven't caught very many fish on that one. So, and it's tougher to tie. You end up having to, to tie the body on, or two sets of hairs that's on the body to make it work. Um, it's a little more complicated. That one is called a blue carry. The blue herring? No, the blue carry. Blue carry. Yeah, because it's you're supposed to use the uh, and basically go through a pile of those pheasant rump feathers and high grade the ones that have a bluish tinge. To uh, them. Bluish tint. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that, so that's pretty hard to find material because most of the feathers yeah. are more on the green side than they're now, on the blue. Now, you see, I'm going to stop here a good three eye lengths, maybe four eye lengths back from the head of the fly. And take my olive this time again. And again, it's got a nice little pattern to it. Strip off all these little bits of fuzz and prepare the feather by exposing the tip the same way as the last time. And Tying it in colored side towards me, tip to the front. And right in that gap between the, the tip and the stripped back feathers, I'm gonna tie that down. Wrap in front. And you see I'm keeping that well back from the eye this time. Fires. And wrap, fold, fold the hackle. One, two, three good wraps and tie it off. Uh, in front, trim, stroke all of this stuff back and tie down. Now you see I've got a good space of in between the eye of the hook and where I've tied that hackle in. I'm going to make a relatively flat body with thread in here because now I'm going to tie in this little collar and that's this after shaft feather now I gotta find one um, I think there's one right there an olive one now this is a really delicate feather so I tie it in by the tip with a little bit the tip sticking out And I don't trim that off, I'm gonna just pull it back. Get my thread forward a bit. Take my hackle pliers. Now this after shaft feather is really uh, fragile. So you, you gotta be very gentle with it. I'll tip, grab it by the tail end there and just wrap it around trying to get it to stand out a little bit to the side as I wrap one, two, and it's a short one, so I'll be lucky if I get three turns. And wrap over in front, one, two, three, and stroke it back. I don't even need to trim that, it's short enough. And I'm going to put a head right in front of it. And I don't need to make a big head on this one. It, it's got enough of a head with the after shaft. And I'm 
whip finish. Got to make sure you keep that loop from the whip finish out of the way of the after shaft that I just tied on. Otherwise, it'll pull it forward when you try to wrap it. And I did, it did pull, I pull a few fibers forward. So I want to trim those out before I put the, uh, the glue on because otherwise the, they'll uh, plug up the eye. And clear the eye of extra glue. And that's him, that's the sparrow. So it does have a little bulk here. Now, the other thing I can, I've done with them is uh, I will use a thread for a rib. And if I rib the body, uh, a dubbed body like that, then I'll take my little Velcro and I will stroke out the, the fur to make the body a little fuzzier through there before I wrap the hackle. So that's, you got two patterns for the price of one there this morning. <laughs> Great so that's Thank you very much. I have to leave. Okay, doc. So that's it for me. Now it's on Florin. Okay. And Let I will stop. What highlighting. I can do. I'll stop highlighting me here. Remove spotlight. And there we go. So you can see, I I can finish. I finished off. A whole whack of those flies and nothing flat. It's a very easy fly to tie. You can do them pretty quick. All right. So, um, so is this one. That's an easy fly to tie. Um, I was uh, doing some variations here and and trying out a few things. While Dave was doing the carry specials, I, I didn't have much time to set up this morning, so I was uh, I was doing a bit of practice tying um, while trying to to follow um, Dave's tying as well. So uh, and this thing is so easy, I I whipped up already uh, half a dozen of them. So this is what it is. It's just uh, some dumbbell eyes um, and some of this uh, stuff, which is called. Um, UV polar chenille. Uh, it's a killer rabbit hairline product. Killer rabbit. Well, you know, if you ever try to take a picture of a rabbit with a flash, you'll get red eyes in a very big way. So those rabbits, they really do look like killer rabbits in some, you mm -hmm. know, if you get a bad picture. So anyway, um, I did some with uh, just plain vanilla with the uh, with the black polar chenille. I have two colors of this polar chenille. I have one that's this bluish thing, and I have this other one, which is which is the one that's officially named black, but has a lot of uh, purplish uh, reflections to it. And um, the other one, the other color is called, um, it's just called blue, fluorescent blue, the other one that I showed you. And then for eyes, I use a variety of things. I have some um, on, the, on the bigger hooks um, I've been using. So here I have some bigger, some bigger hooks. I've been using um, this bigger eyes, 730 seconds. Um, these are very nice eyes. I've, I've fished one of these streamers like for a whole day. And the yellow uh, plastic stuff here uh, stayed put. I got a little chip in one of the eyes hitting rocks, but otherwise it stayed put. And so this is this is a good pattern to fish when you're fishing relatively 
a relatively shallow stream um, and you've got rocks and all kinds of other snags to worry about. Um, and so that was, I found this to be quite handy for that, um, for that, for that purpose. All right. So the tying is actually quite, uh, it's actually quite simple. Um, the hooks I've been using are some, um, Mustad standard, um, these are what used to be called the 34011 streamer hook which is a saltwater hook. So these are size six. They're relatively longer shank hooks. Then I have some um, of the um, Mastad's 34, whoops, 3407s, 34007s in size six as well. These look a lot smaller. They're also officially a size six, but they're much, they're much shorter shank. So on something like this, I'm going to go with a slightly uh, smaller eye. I have these hourglass eyes that I just showed you earlier. It's 4.5 millimeters. I have some of these uh, yellow eyes as well in a slightly smaller size, the 316s. Whatever kind of looks looks better to you. And also it's a question of how much how much weight do you want there, right? So if you're fishing a sinking line and you just want a little bit of weight to flip the fly over to make it a bit more snag free, um, bead chain works just as well. If you want a lot of weight, you go with the, with the heavy ones. And then the other hook that I, I like to use for tying these types of streamers is this uh, straight eye. All of these hooks that I've been tying on are straight eye hooks. This is the uh, Arex uh, hook. And they make this, this thing that's also supposed to be good for salt water. And it's a black, uh, kind of black nickel sort of um, color, color hook. And again, you can see that this, the size, uh, this is a size eight hook I put here in the vise. And here is the size six Mastad by comparison. Actually, the size eight is way bigger. So just use your eye and whatever, whatever you're trying to, uh, whatever you're trying to achieve here as a, as a guide. There's no hard and fast, uh, hard and fast rule. So I've been catching, uh, I've been catching rainbows with this quite, quite well. And uh, I'm hoping to be able to try them out on some bull trout, uh, weather permitting, of course. So thread, just use a, a Danville three odd, which is kind of equivalent to a uni six odd, um, and do a little thread bump just behind the eye of the hook. That's going to help stabilize the uh, the dumbbell. So Dave did several demonstrations with uh, closer minnows. That's basically the same idea. Um, you figure eight the thread to set your eyes in place. Make sure that they're straight before you do a few final. Whoops. So here, this is where you, you put as much tension as your thread will allow before breaking because tight wraps will make nice and tight eyes. Okay, once that's in place, you can do a fancier version where you put a, mar a bit of marabou for a tail. So just some basic black marabou, nothing fancy. <clears throat> and just get a clump of fibers. It's still very dry here. Everything sticks to my fingers. And put a bit of a tail in. You can put a bit of flash on the side of the tail as well. So I'm, I'm just going to demonstrate the fancier version and then you can just drop ingredients as you see fit. 
So put in a tail, don't worry about the extra fuzz. It's just gonna add a little bulk to the body. A couple of turns under the tail, it's going to keep your tail for, from falling into the, into the hook. If this comes out to be a little too long, just pinch and don't, don't use your scissors here, just break it so you get this sort of raggedy, raggedy look. If you want to put the, the flash in the tail, just get any sort of handy flash material that you have that's reasonably fine. One strand is more than you, you need, depending on how long it is. This is kind of half the length of the standard crystal flash, so I can use a whole strand, otherwise probably half a strand is plenty. And there we just fold it a few times, cut it, and then pull it over the hook and secure with a few turns of thread and then cut it so it's not much longer than the tail. So it's just kind of mixed in the tail a little bit and it's going to be showing, it should be showing, unless I did something very wrong, it should be showing on both sides of the tail. Okay, so you can skip this step if you if you don't like to, to fuss with all this extra stuff and just cut to the chase, which is using the, the polar flash. Now, this is, you know, you can hold it like a ball like this in your hand and try to wrap it on the hook. Or I tried to be clever here and it sort of works. I don't know, I may want to tinker with this a little bit. I took a tiny little Ziploc bag and stuffed it all in there so I can keep it in there in my hand without having that big ball to uh, to maneuver around. And I find this to be a little bit easier. And the challenge with this is that this, this is basically like a chenille with just very long strands. And I don't have to explain this in detail because Dave just showed you how to do folded hackle. It's the same idea, except you're doing it with this chenille material. You just attach this to the hook. And all the time you're working with this, just try to fold back the fibers so you don't, your thread doesn't catch any fibers that will then end up pointing forward and making your fly not look very, uh, very nice in your fly box. In the water, it's not that important because this is very, very soft it is going to flow with the water. So the fly is gonna look fine to the fish, but nah, in the fly box, you know, when you show off your flies, um, you know, you wanna make sure that they look as neat as possible. And then just keep wrapping. And as you wrap, keep folding back. A little tedious but given that the fly is so simple this is still letting you tie it doesn't fly the night before you go fishing and come here to behind the eyes if you try to do a few wraps in front of the eyes, the fly doesn't come out very nice because you end up with a lot of fibers sticking out wildly because of the eyes. What I end up doing is I just basically pull this on the underside towards the eye of the hook and then separate as many fibers as I can. And then once I have as much of these unruly fibers out of the way, I secure with two or three turns of thread. Again, pull all of this mess behind if I can, as much as possible. Anything that's totally out of the way is going to be simply, you know, like this, this thing here, just cut it out. A little bit of a haircut at the end I find to be useful. 
and then do a few turns in front there and then squeeze in your your scissors try to put them in that tight spot and then trim the chenille and now just do a couple of whip finishes at the eye of the hook get the extra fibers off here so like this try to do a little bit of a neat head and then we finish again and try to get those things out of the way so I don't get trapped fibers and one more time Oops. and then trim the thread now as a final touch if you're happy with with the way this looks you just leave it like this and go fishing otherwise what you can do is you can do a little bit of trimming here to give it a little bit more of a torpedo shape so that it doesn't end but i what i'm trying to to avoid is having a blunt end to the fly i want it to be a little bit thinner towards the back so these extra fibers that would all end making a, a very sort of thick butt to this fly if i if i give them a little bit of a haircut like this so a little bit like this just kind of look at it from from various sides by the way having a vacuum cleaner handy probably would have been a <laughs> very good idea here um i'm gonna pay for this i'm sure um so yeah just let your artistic freedom get the better of you you know your frustrated hairdresser instincts let them lose and when you're happy you know just make sure you leave some on the fly <laughs> yeah that's it it's easier than pruning trees <laughs> and then you just tie it on and and go fishing and i if you guys uh, try something like this I'd, I'd like to know if uh if it works in the lake because i think it ought to but for me, trying this thing on a lake, it's going to be another month, probably. I don't, uh, I don't have an ice auger. And that's All that. Right. I've done some in different colors because I was curious about this, uh, this blue, blue Chanel. And put a bit of a tail. It looks to me a little better with a bit of a black tail in there. And then vary the, the type of eye, the type of hook and so on and that's that it's uh it's meant to be easy well done yeah both uh both uh ties today were good and simple ties as well very few materials yeah so i got the um i think the eyes came from trout bum 